Hello, everyone. Uh, in this presentation, we want to speak about the uh, Adams Bridge Accelerator. This is a post-quantum crypto accelerator. Uh, and while we're speaking, there is actually a demo on the uh, Microsoft uh, Boost for the Adams Bridge. So this is a uh, prototype of uh, Adams Bridge on the FPGA. Uh, please attend and see uh, what we offer you for this actually uh, demo. My name is Moshaba, and I'm here with uh, my colleagues Embre and uh, Kiran to present the side channel uh, countermeasures that we have for the uh, Adams Bridge PQC accelerator. But before that, I want to actually uh, discuss about the high level picture of the Adams Bridge, what we have, and what is the performance and area specification of Adams Bridge before going to uh, countermeasure details of the, this design. So, uh, Adams Bridge accelerator was announced in the previous OCP. And uh, it, uh, it contains uh, two uh, PQC algorithm for the digital signature and also chi exchange. Right now, the current version uh, contains the dilithium MLDSA 87. And we actually have uh, the plan to embed uh, to uh, implement Kyber as a part of the Adams Bridge project everywhere. We target uh, two different performance levels for this accelerator. Uh, for the embedded architecture and high speed design. And uh, the embedded system will be uh, integrated to the Calitra uh, 2.0 uh, to make it a quantum safe root of trust engine. From the uh, area and performance uh, specification, uh, we actually use different uh, optimization techniques to make the, uh, this PQC engine uh, as small as, uh, as compact as ECC. And the current actual results that we have uh, shows that it is around 1.22x uh, ECC384. And from the performance level, uh, for performance results, signing operation, which is the most actual time consuming operation in the uh, PQC signing uh, operation, is around 10 times faster than ECC. For the decision and uh, verification, uh, as you see, it actually uh, shows better uh, performance. The current design that we have uh, converged to 500 megahertz, and uh, we believe that we can push it to 600 to 800 uh, megahertz with some uh, manual uh, changes. And for the highest speed design, we, uh, our goal is to push the design to one gigahertz. Uh, the uh, entire implementation is open source and published, so you can uh, go to this actual repo that uh, is mentioned in this actual slide and uh, use the uh, RTL. OK. Thank you, Mojtaba. So I will tell a different part of Adams Bridge. So that's why I think that we need to talk about quantum computers. So we know that like, the quantum computers are being developed, and we know that they can solve some problems that cannot be solved by the classical computers. That's why we expect uh, like, um, many exciting applications from these computers. But at the same time, they bring some problems because they can solve some math problems in that they give the hardness to classical computers. So back in 2017, uh, this danger was like discovered by also NIST. So they in initiated a standardization process and like it was a, like a long journey and after three rounds, they announced that uh, they wanna select crystal dilithium. One of their candidate is gonna be standardized. And now Adams Bridge is on uh, hardware implementation of this algorithm. So this side channel track, I mean attacks or the threats are also uh, well recognized by NIST. So during the standardization process, uh, NIST uh, pay attention for the side channel attacks and inform the designers, algorithm designers to be aware of these attacks while developing their algorithms. Um, because like we know that now with the PQC we are like trying to secure ourselves against quantum computing. But it doesn't mean that we are secure against like physical attacks. Uh, what I mean, like they're not targeting specifically this algorithm, uh, the attacker targets in the implementation. So while the implementation is running on a device, the attacker is like capturing some uh, traces. It can be like power trace or timing execution or EM signals. And then later on, these signals can be used in the to recover the secret part of these algorithms. And so far we know that there are like more than 10 different attacks uh, for crystal dilithium. And 
For the even extreme cases, we know that these attacks can recover the secret with just one trace, meaning that's just one power trace is enough to destroy the system. So while like we are trying to protect ourselves, we have a strategy that has four steps. First step is analyzing, uh, meaning that we are trying to first explore the vulnerabilities, and based on that, we are trying to create a solid threat model, defining our uh, threat vectors, and based on the threat vectors, we are building a countermeasure uh, to protect our design against side channel attack, and right after that, we also validate in both ways, empirically and theoretically, uh, whether these countermeasures are like true by their claims or not. While doing that, we have some challenges that we have faced so far. So we know that like side channel attacks are really strong and powerful, and they can even like break AES in a few seconds for different attack scenarios. And we know that like post-quantum cryptography also introduces new operations such as NTT and sampler. So why it is that like a problem for us? Because like we know that side channels are like well being studied for two decades. And during these two decades, we know like attacks on RSA and ECC. But the thing is that, as I said, side channel targets the implementation, not the algorithm. So it means that the existing solutions for RSA or ECC cannot be extended to directly the post quantum cryptography. And then another problem is the cost. So like security always comes with its cost, we know that. But with the side channel, this cost is increasing. And there are some studies in literature shows that the area delay overhead goes up to 4,500 times. So I'm gonna give an example like how we are doing this evaluation and how we are like creating this threat model. Um, so we first, like as I said, review the literature listing the existing side channel attack. And we are going beyond that. We are like also extending our scope by like discovering the new vulnerabilities if it is possible. And then like we are performing this vulnerability assessment on the data flow and algorithm flow. And then categorizing this um, like the operations based on our priority list. And later on, we are like reviewing this priority list if there is a, like an update on the RTL or the RTL is being developed. On the right side, for example, you see an example of, of uh, signing flow for MLDSA. And you see there are some operations are labeled blue, some of them are red. And I give an example of two of the operations, PWM and NTT. And these operations are examined with uh, like attack vectors of some of the questions. And based on these questions, we are like defining if they need countermeasure. If there is a, like a countermeasure need, what kind of countermeasure it should be. So now, as an example of a countermeasure, I'll give a background info about masking. Masking is an effective countermeasure against side channel attack. So the main idea is that instead of performing an operation on the secret shares, you are like splitting shares into like randomized shares and performing this operation on these random shares. So I'll give an example to illustrate this case with an adder. So in this case, you see A and B going through an addition operation to generate C. And instead of performing addition over A and B, what we do, we are like getting two random numbers, R0 and R1. And we are first subtracting these numbers from A and B and then performing an addition operation on these new shares. And we are repeating the same operation on a different adder. Now we are like adding R0 and R1. Those are the random numbers that we use to split A and B. And instead of getting one result, C, we are getting C0 and C1. So we have now two outputs. When you combine them, you will get again C value. So main idea in here is that we need to like preserve the functionality, but at the same time, we need to like randomize the inputs because when the operation is happening, we are refreshing this randomness. It means that every time the inputs are independent from the secrets. So it will like independent um, power execution or EM signal while these operations are happening thanks to this randomness. So now I'll take over. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Amir. Okay, so another type of countermeasure is shuffling. And the main idea here, instead of modifying the inputs, you just modify the order of execution of those inputs. So on the right here, we have a data flow diagram for an NTT operation. So let's say in an unprotected design, stage one operates on input pairs 0, 4, 1, 5, 2, 6, and 3, 7. But with shuffling enabled, that order can look something like 2, 6, 3, 7, go back to 0, 4, and then 1, 5. So 
um, compared to masking, shuffling is very lightweight. Um, so there is low area overhead. There is no latency overhead from the arithmetic side. There is no memory overhead because we're not modifying the coefficients. Um, however, it is not as strong as masking. It is still vulnerable to trace averaging attacks. So before we look into how we're implementing masking and shuffling in Adamsbridge, um, let's spend a couple of minutes trying to understand what the entity is. We said it a couple of times. Um, let's look at what it looks like, and then we can um, look at how we're using these uh, countermeasures to protect it. So the entity is the number theoretic transform, and it is used to efficiently multiply polynomials. So with the use of entity, the order of complexity comes down from n squared to n log n. Uh, within the entity, we have a two by two butterfly architecture where each butterfly takes two inputs, produces two outputs. And so the two by two architecture produces four outputs per cycle in a pipeline architecture. Um, each butterfly in Adamsbridge is reconfigurable, meaning with the same set of hardware, we're able to perform entity, inverse entity, pointwise multiplication, pointwise addition, and pointwise subtraction operations, all with the same set of hardware. We also have a buffer which is reconfigurable and it's mainly used to interface with the memory and um, we just uh, load the coefficients from the memory into the buffer, accumulate them, and then we perform the operations on columns of those buffers. So first it's going to be buffer column zero, column one, two, and three. Um, because of this two by two architecture, the memory that we have that stores all these inputs um, is laid out in such a way that we have four coefficients per address. So for a polynomial of size 256 coefficients, we um, have 64 addresses of four coefficients each that we need to process in order to process one full polynomial. Now, to implement shuffling, we uh, reorganize the memory a little bit. So instead of considering it as a 64 address memory, we now say that it's 16 chunks of four addresses each. And then uh, we add first level of randomization by randomizing the starting chunk um, for each stage. So for example, first stage can start with chunk five instead of chunk zero. Um, and then the second one can start with chunk 11 and so on. And from there, the chunks are processed in order and wrapped back around. Um, and then, so within this chunk, we accumulate the 16 coefficients into the buffer. And now we add a second level of randomization by randomizing the column that we process. So instead of doing 0, 1, 2, 3, we could do 2, 3, 0, 1, um, or 3, 0, 1, 2, and so on. Here we can calculate a metric, the search space, to be um, 16 for the number of chunks times four to the 16, where four is the search space within each chunk. That comes out to be 68 billion, and the larger this number, the stronger the countermeasure. So the NTT would now look something like this which, with shuffling enabled. So there's no change on the two by two architecture. Uh, there's no change in the memory. The uh, controller would now have some logic to uh, maintain the shuffling. Um, and the memory accesses, and the buffer would now increase a little bit uh, and have top and bottom halves, and um, so while the bottom half is being processed, the top half is filled, and then we ping pong to the top half to process while the bottom half, half is filled with new inputs. And uh, the buffer increase helps us maintain the throughput of the design as compared to the unprotected one. And so the next, um, okay, so and uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention here is um, this is a very lightweight mechanism, so we're not changing any of the arithmetic blocks, so there's no area overhead there. There's very little area over overhead from the buffer, and there's no memory overhead, and there's no latency overhead either. So it's a very lightweight countermeasure. However, um, there are some operations in dilithium algorithm, specifically the pointwise multiplication and the inverse entity, and these uh, directly re uh, process secrets, and it is very critical to um, implement a strong countermeasure for these op uh, option, uh, operations. So shuffling and mass, shuffling is not um, strong enough to protect these counter uh, operations, and so we go for masking. Now, if we are to fully mask this entity, it would look something like this on the right. Uh, we have each butterfly masked, and so instead of getting two inputs, now it would get four input shares, and it would produce four output shares, and in total, we have eight shares that we need to now store into the memory. So that comes out to be four times the memory overhead, four times the area overhead from the arithmetic side, um, four times the latency overhead because we need to now start adding pipeline stages to ensure functionality of this masking uh, design. Um, however, this is a very strong countermeasure, um, even though it's very expensive. Now, how can we optimize this for Adamsbridge? 
So we came up with a hybrid approach. So here, what we do is we combine the point waste multiplication and inverse entity to be one operation. So we consider that as a one hybrid operation where um, the inputs from the memory are in their original form. Then they are split on the fly into shares. Those are passed on to fully masked multipliers. They uh, produce output shares, which are then given to the first stage of the inverse entity, which is fully masked. Um, the first stage of the inverse entity produces shares, which are then combined on the fly, and then given to the second stage of the inverse entity, which is unmasked. And so the final output of the two by two architecture is still back in the original form, so we're not incurring any uh, memory overhead here. And the latency that we have to pay for is just coming from one stage of the entire inverse entity operation. So in total, there's, that's eight stages, so um, one eighth of that latency is what we're paying for with this hybrid approach. And um, the other thing that I wanted to mention here is the other operations, NTT, pointwise addition, pointwise subtraction, um, those all will go through the right side of the branch where it's just unmasked uh, first stage and unmasked second stage of the butterfly units. So they won't see this latency overhead. And um, uh, one thing to note here is all these operations, whether masked or unmasked, will have shuffling by default. So all of the inputs are randomized, all of them are going back to the memory in random order, so we have some extra protection there. And while the unmasked operations are happening, we keep the masked side of things enabled, so that adds some extra noise to the power consumption. I'll turn it over to Emery to conclude this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, as we mentioned that like post quantum crypto algorithms, they like provide theoretical security against like quantum computing. But like we do not have a guarantee for the side channel attacks. So that's why we need strong, but at the same time effective side channel countermeasures to protect Adams Bridge. Um, so we propose like masking solution. We know that like this is strong, but it's also like costly. So we are not completely masking the entire scheme. We are like partially masking it whenever it is necessary. And we know that like shuffling is lightweight, but not as strong as like uh, masking. So that's why we are applying like partially shuffling, partially masking and combining to provide the full security claim that we want. And while doing that, we are not like, as I said, naively mask entire uh, algorithm by considering the cost. So that's why like we um, prioritize the, the target points that can be exploited by the side channel attacks, uh, starting from the high, medium and low. And um, like for this, like the countermeasure, we are planning to integrate it uh, to uh, Adams Bridge and later on this Adams Bridge will be integrated with the Calatra 2.0. Um, now we already like provide uh, area delay efficient solution, but there's always a room to, to have a like more optimized design. And we also wanna provide a, a parametric mask design because in our scheme we are like providing first order masking but later on, uh, we wanna like provide a system that can be configurable in design time if it, it is required to increase the masking level for further security. And we also actively encourage the security community to examine, test, and challenge our countermeasures. That's why like we are making this code open source in GitHub. Um, so I believe that like this collaborative effort uh, will strengthen our security claims. Thank you very much. First of all, very clever hybrid approach. Um, can you talk a little bit about the fourth pillar you said on validation? Has there been some empirical study yeah. on the effectiveness of this first order, second order? Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the question. So like when you propose a masking solution, in the literature we generally have two ways to validate its security claims. So first way is like empirical validation, as we said, it requires like such as like TVLA, a statistical test, or DPA, CPA kind of attacks. Uh, but when you have like shuffling, um, like you can't just do like empirical validation as we do for the masking, but the difference is that you cannot perform formal verification for the shuffling while you can do it for masking. Because masking can provide a statistical distance and it can be proven theoretically. And we are doing that because we are designing our uh, entire masking circuit from the smaller gadgets. And for each gadget, we are like performing formal verification. But for shuffling, we do not have the same approach, but still we can provide a search space 
uh, for shuffle and counter measure. Does it answer your question? Okay. At the beginning, you mentioned a high and a low performance version of this. Can you describe a little bit what the difference is in the implementation to support that? Okay, for the embedded system, we try actually to compact the design as much as we can, and it would be actually different use cases for that. For the high performance design, we try actually to push the frequency, reduce the latency, and make it, you know, uh, there are different use cases. Let's say, for example, uh, you have uh, IoT devices, and it has actually low, uh, you know, uh, capacity from the memory, from the, you know, silicon area, what, uh, what we are talking about, about the, uh, what we actually consider as a, uh, resources, hardware resources. So for those actual applications, uh, we try actually to uh, limit the uh, silicon area that we need for the Adams Bridge. However, for the some high speed design that we, we have, some applications that needs to perform tens of uh, signing, uh, you know, uh, or thousands of signing, uh, we actually, we need to, uh, push the frequency, and also at the same time try to reduce the latency at the same time to make it faster. From the implementation point of view, there are different approach for that. Uh, one of them is based on your need, you can, for example, uh, remove or uh, cancel out some of the countermeasures that add some latency to the total actually, uh, latency of the, the total actually performance results of the, uh, of the design. The other approach is, uh, the changes in the RTL that, uh, you know, push the design to one gigahertz. So that's another actual change from the RTL point of view. And also some, uh, you know, components that we have in the design can be uh, parallelized more to actually gives you, because lattice-based crypto in most of the case, uh, uh, there are actually uh, uh, good, comp uh, good crypto al uh, algorithm from the uh, parallelization. So you can actually make more polarization there, but it would be at the cost of the more resources. Go ahead. Yeah, you can ask it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry thanks, for this. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just, just one quick question. So what considerations have you guys taken into account with respect to fault injection attacks? Yeah, uh, for this, specifically for this presentation, we just focus on the side channel attacks. So that's why our countermeasures is providing a security against side channel attacks. In this concept, we are not like concerned right now fault injections, but I think that later on we will like include this attacks all into our scope. All right, thank you. There is one more question. Sorry. It looks like for Clipra, Calyptra 2, um, they're looking to combine traditional signatures like ECC along with dilithium. And I saw in your earlier slides that, you know, um, dilithium is 70 times faster than ECC. So I was wondering, have you guys given that any thought where you, is there any opportunity for parallel processing between, um, in the crypto algorithms between these two? Uh, the foundation of these actually algorithms are completely different, so we cannot actually uh, reuse some parts of the, uh, you know, subcomponents in the dilithium to a speed up in the ECC. And uh, the another factor here is uh, dilithium signature operation is not constant time. So 10 times faster is on average, but in some current cases it may take actually more time. It's actually the, uh, there's a loop inside the signing operation that uh, makes the design, you know, uh, non-constant time. So it's another actually consideration here. So we cannot, uh, you know, make them exactly at the same time or uh, have a resource sharing technique here to make them both faster at the same time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.